Today we're going to be talking about animal behavior. This is chapter five. Some things we're going to focusing, focus on are all the key terms, um, explaining why this is actually a life-threatening condition uh, in pets, uh, what your role is in it, and how to get a behavioral history. It's a little bit different from getting a medical history. It actually takes a lot more time. We're going to talk about how animals learn, how to differentiate between how we can train them, um, what are offered behaviors, continuous inter intermittent reinforcement, talking about extinction of a behavior and how that's difficult, and then dis distinguishing between um, different ways of modifying behavior. I'm going to talk about a very specific five-step positive proaction plan, and then uh, the importance of socialization, habituating young animals to handling. Um, some challenges for uh, socializing older animals, and then how you could be uh, helpful and the role that medication uh, can play in adjusting animal behavior. Behavior problems are actually the leading cause of death in pets in the United States. Uh, problem behavior is the most common reason for dogs and cats to be surrendered to animal shelters, and it's an in inextricable part of brain physiology. And when we talk about physiology, we're talking about how the whole body works together. And you'll learn that the brain is really important in the way that the entire body um, responds to stresses, uh, diseases, etc. So behavior is a huge part of our of medical, um, uh, our, our medicine uh, with animals. So what is your job? You're the first to interact with clients and pets in the examination room, so you're the first to become aware of problem behaviors, and you may see them before the client sees them. When you're working with a client uh, with behavior problems, it tends to become very personal, um, so you want to be very non-threatening and empathetic. Um, remember that at some point in your life, you're probably going to encounter or have an animal in which you have to deal with this behavior. Um, so do try to be empathetic and realize that this could also happen to you. You want to take a behavior related history and we'll talk about how uh, the different questions you want to ask with that um, and how to avoid certain things in order to um, distance the owner's emotions uh, from the behavior. You want to be alert and ask about injuries on the person because we'll often see injuries on the person that are related to the animal and they don't see that as an issue and it actually is an issue. You want to provide good behavior related handouts and uh, just realize that there is a, a, an Academy of Veterinary Behavior Technicians. It's a specialty that's recognized by the National Association of Veterinary Technicians in America. So this, the specific behavior history that you're going to um, talk about is you're going to want the owner to describe actions of the pet only. Um, when, when the client associates a feeling with what the animal is doing, it makes it a lot more personal. And when it makes it more personal, the owner really puts a little less responsibility on the owner to correct this behavior. Uh, it also makes it harder to separate the animal's behavior from the person's feelings and for the person dealing with behavior. Um, detail of the history can vary. So sometimes we can get a lot of detail and sometimes we don't get much detail. So we want to get just the right amount of detail. So what is wrong with this statement? Fluffy hates me. She's so mad at me for we need to separate that emotional tie to the and those emotional words, hate and mad, um, and and really just go back to what is Fluffy doing? Well, when I leave the house, Fluffy is tearing, getting into the trash and spreading it throughout the house, or tearing into the cushions. We need to know exactly what's going on. We need to know when it's going on. Is she doing it right when you leave the house, or is she doing it when before you come home? Um, and so those are different things that we can can um, start to identify where the behavior is occurring, why it's occurring, and how we can adjust the behavior um, of the client in order to adjust the behavior of the uh, pet. Animals 
most likely do not respond from a moral code of right and wrong. They just do something. They repeat behaviors that make them feel good and avoid behaviors that do not. So tearing things up or getting into the trash, it has to do with um, finding food, being bored, uh, you know, needing something to do to expend energy. Uh, if they have anxiety, that's a different kind of energy and they still need to expend that energy. A dog getting into the fridge, that's a smart dog. Um, that's a dog that uh, is motivated to get a reward. Um, and so that's really all that it means. Associative learning is when we have a learned association between two events, and it depends on two factors. And these are bigger words, but I'm going to explain them to you. Contiguity and contingency. T contiguity is the relationship between two events in time and place. A trash can that is full of food is a reward. And if, you, if an animal sees a trash can and every time it sees a trash can, or most of the time it sees a trash can, uh, it is full of food and the, and the food is the reward, they're going to associate the trash can with food. That's contiguity. That's the relationship. Contingency is the predictability of the association, and this is what's most easily learned. So the more often we have an open trash can full of food, the more likely we are going to be to associate that food with the trash can. Um, and it doesn't have to be full of food every time, um, but it, you know if it's if it's um, full of food most of the time, then I'm going to try to get into that trash can because I know it's going to be full of food. There are uh, two types of associative learning. It's respondent and operant conditioning. conditioning. Respondent is our classical, uh, what we think of Pavlovian or reflexive involuntary conditioning. For instance, um, when a dog smells food, their mouth starts to water. It starts the digestive process, and that's just a normal physiologic um, reaction. It's a reflex. Well, what Pavlov in his experiment uh, did is he showed, he found out that dogs start to drool when they are, associate the smell of food. Well, he would start to ring a bell when the dog smelled the food and started to salivate. And eventually what he found was as soon as he rang a bell, the dog anticipated there would be food and started to salivate. So ringing the bell started the salivation versus the food starting the salivation. That's still a reflexive response. It's involuntary. And that's called respondent conditioning. Um, we do that uh, type of respondent conditioning when we're talking about clicker training. That clicker uh, becomes the bell. Operant training um, takes some of the respondent training and turns it into a response stimulus relationship. But it, it, it encourages the animal to start to learn, use their brain, not just a reflex, but using their brain to create a situation in which they get rewarded. So the operant is the, um, the animal is creating a, a situation or responding in a certain way in order to get rewarded. And this is trial and error learning. It's dependent on consequences of reinforcement and punishment. We're going to talk about what is reinforcement, what is punishment specifically. It's a response stimulus relationship. For instance, we want this seal to balance a ball on its nose and if it bounces the ball on its nose, we're going to give it a fish. Now, how do we teach the seal to balance the ball on its nose? We may put it there first and then give them a fish. And then put it there and barely hold it and give them a fish. And then throw it to them. They balance it, they get a fish. They're going to be more likely to balance the ball on their nose when they get a fish. Or if they get a fish for doing so. So... How do we use this um, in order to create the behaviors that we want? Um, and there are specific definitions to um, talk about how animals learn. And I'm going to want you to understand these very specific terms. Positive reinforcement. Anything with re uh, positive means something is added. Reinforcement means it's um, something that is um, uh, something that is added that is pleasant. pleasant. A positive reinforcement is something that is added that is pleasant. So giving a treat to a dog after a behavior is positive reinforcement. Petting a dog 
doing a clicker training on a dog, that is positive reinforcement. And we found that that's pretty effective. It's actually one of, if you're, if you're separating all four of these out, positive reinforcement is the most effective. And there are two types of positive reinforcement. There's continuous and there's intermittent. And we're going to talk about why intermittent reinforcement is actually better than continuous. Continuous would be if you sit, you get a treat every single time. Intermittent is actually a little bit more um, effective, and we'll talk about why that is. Positive punishment is when something unpleasant is added. Something unpleasant is punishment, and it's added, added because it's positive punishment. It's added after behavior. So if an animal is pulling on you and you pull on a prong collar to correct that behavior, that's positive punishment. Positive punishment is also if an animal comes um, to you and starts to bite you, you smack them on the nose. That's also pas positive punishment. It has its merits and it has its effects. There are times when saying no to an animal, stopping a behavior uh, can be helpful. Uh, but there are times when it is overused and, and can actually cause the animal to go into a fear, uh, f a fight or flight response. Um, and when that happens, the animal cannot learn in that situation. So times when it's useful, times when it's not, it has to be done exactly right. And we'll talk about that. It has to be done exactly right, exactly the right time for it to be useful. Negative reinforcement is when something unpleasant is taken away or avoided. So a negative reinforcement would be if we're walking on a leash and the animal starts to, to pull and we correct that um, and then as soon as they come back we take that unemployed uh, uh, that correction away the the most common way to use this is a gentle leader or a halty the the muzzle type thing that you see a head halter um, over a uh, an animal's um, nose if we put them into a, um, a a sit or pull their head back to to us it's a little unpleasant um, but as soon as they put themselves back into a position of uh, calm walk, we take that unpleasantness away. Um, and so that's an example. A, a gentle leader would be an example of a negative reinforcement. Negative punishment is when something pleasant. An example of this would be trying to teach a puppy not to bite. One way that we do this is we tether the puppy to something so they can't move away from an area. We start to play with them. It's, it's normal for puppies to play with their mouths. But if they bite on an an, on a person, um, we will stop the play. Um, as soon as they bite on a person, we walk away from them. If we walk away from them, play goes away. So that's something pleasant they're looking forward to is taken away. Often, they will lie down or sit and, and think about what was going on. And as soon as they start playing with their toys appropriately or sit down, we can go back to them and praise them and talk and, and start playing with them again. As soon as they put their mouths on us, we walk away. Again, that's negative punishment. The types of reinforcement that we can use. So this, these are the treats that we can use. And the way that we use them is really important. Continuous reinforcement is provided every time an animal does something you want repeated. And that can be helpful to start a behavior. Um, so when they're start, starting to learn to sit, giving them a treat every time they get just the right position, all four on the floor, um, butt on the ground, that's a good way to do it. Um, an example of this would be like a vending machine. You put money in, you get a product out. You, you use that because it's consistent. You know that you're going to get something, um, and so you use the same behavior to get it. Intermittent reinforcement is when you give it only periodically when the animal performs the desired behavior. So the animal knows how to sit. You can tell the animal to sit and it knows that behavior, it knows that what that word means. At this point, you can give this, um, uh, this treat intermittently. And to explain why this is uh, a little bit uh, better, uh, way to train or to, to encourage the dog to continue the, this behavior is that it never knows when it's going to get that treat. So an example of this would be a slot machine. If you sat at a slot machine gambling 
um, at a casino and every time you put a quarter in and pulled the handle you got a quarter out every single time you would get pretty bored pretty quickly and so you would try some other games because that's too boring so an animal trying other behaviors because the first one is too boring because they know they're going to get the same thing every time um, is kind of like what what would happen if you got bored as a slot machine if however you put a quarter into the slot machine you pull the handle you don't get anything you try again you get a jackpot um, you get a ton of quarters coming out you're more likely to sit a little bit longer at the slot machine and try that behavior again so that's why we know that works the third type of reinforcement is and it's kind of negative reinforcement is extinction and this is breaking an association between two events if an animal can never get into a trash can <clears throat> again because and and get food again there's no reward for getting into the trash can because it because they cannot get into it that eventually will stop that behavior uh, if they smell food or at some point you leave it open it could increase that behavior again so you do have to because that turns into intermittent reinforcement but you can extinguish behaviors it just takes a lot longer and a lot more consistency to break a uh, behavior Methods for addressing respondent fear. So we know that most of our animals, when they're um, doing aggressive behaviors or poor behaviors, it's related to a fear or a, a, an unknown. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that we can address that. The first one is called systemic, systematic uh, desensitization. So that's uh, changing the emotional response by using a hierarchy of stimuli from the least to the most stimulating. So teeny tiny spiders not as scary as great big spiders coming through the door okay so and and doing it from farther away and gradually getting closer um, and and rewarding that behavior for being calm from farther away and gradually getting it closer that systematic desensitization um, for instance this uh, uh, this person being able to walk into a room with jars full of spiders uh, it takes some time and some conditioning and some desensitization but eventually um, can do it um, of course this is this big spider coming in the door is going to ruin everything uh, so we have to be careful of that but eventually you can get used to things that you're scared of counter conditioning or counter commanding is when we substitute an incompatible response to a behavior we're rewarding a separate behavior while exposing the animal to the stimulus it fears so if this animal is continuously running after bikes because it and biting at the bikes because it doesn't know what it is and just wants to get rid of the bike what we can do is we can teach it to sit instead and we can condition it to every time it sees a bike sit um, and uh, so this person is um, counter conditioning the bikes riding by it's not hurting the animal the animal can learn to cal be calm and relaxed around the bike um, so that's counter conditioning the last one is response blocking flooding this is preventing the animal from escaping a fearful stimulus until it's no longer fearful this is a less desirable approach because what it does is it it actually blocks an, a normal uh, instinctual response uh, to a danger so one example would be if you don't know how to swim you're scared of swimming you get thrown into the deep end um, this is not an appropriate way to teach an animal how to swim um, they may no longer be fearful of it uh, but that may not be necessarily a good thing this is something that can be done in certain situations um, but it's probably not the best way uh, to respond to a fearful situation the five-step positive proaction plan for technicians this is in your book in chapter five um, first of all we want to elicit and reinforce an appropriate behavior um, greeting in in pets you'll notice that greeting in pets is really broken especially in this country um, we allow pets to jump on us and to give us an effusive greeting which causes them to increase their energy level and sometimes their anxiety turn it into anxiety uh, and that creates a, a major behavioral issue not only can it be really dangerous for pets greeting uh, other pets or for people um, it it 
can uh, cause a, a problem with them uh, because they need to increase their energy in order to properly, what they term properly, agree people in, in a different way. If we can reinforce and start to reinforce uh, in more and more pets an appropriate greeting behavior, where it's a sniff and a move along kind of greeting, we can actually minimize that anxiety, minimize that energy, and make pets a lot more appropriate, a lot more safe around people and other pets. So that's one example of how to enlist and reinforce an appropriate behavior. We want to prevent or minimize inappropriate behavior. How do we in a, uh, minimize um, an effusive greeting? We put them on a leash, but we can't just put them on a leash because a lot of people can't control their pets on leashes. They pull them. Um, so we need to uh, also teach them how to sit uh, when greeting. So if we put their butt down, they're less likely to be able to pull. We want to be able to meet their behavioral and developmental needs. So we want to be able to uh, teach them uh, uh, how to socially greet a lot of different people uh, at a young age. We also want to give them plenty of time, uh, uh, opportunities to make mistakes and to exercise and, and to, uh, uh, to be able to choose good behaviors. Um, we want to use the takeaway method or negative punishment to discourage inappropriate uh, behavior. That's a great way of teaching bite inhibition. We want to minimize discipline or positive punishment and use it correctly only when necessary. So we corrective behavior, corrective um, punishment or corrective discipline is necessary in certain um, aspects of, of training and, and molding, um, but we want to use it very quickly. Um, typically within half a second, that's 0.5 seconds of a, of a behavior, and with just strong enough force that it stops the behavior but does not initiate fear. Once we put an animal into their fear brain, they are no longer able to process information. And so we want to really try to keep them in their thinking brain. So we want to stop the behavior but we don't want to put them in fear. We want to stop the behavior and teach them the right thing to do. Habituation to handling, this is socialization. Um, all animals can be habituated to restraint and common handling procedures, which makes your life a lot easier in the, in the clinic. But when we begin it young, it helps to make the task a lot easier. I have a list here. Um, you can find it at dogtrainingexcellence.com. Um, it's a puppy socialization checklist. If you haven't done these things with your dog, this might be something you can start at any time, but, it, but you may have to start slower um, and softer with older animals. So right after adoption, there are lots of things that you can do in your home or with um, healthy other healthy pets uh, to, to do before their vaccines. After their first vaccines or after they're fully vaccinated, you can start to uh, socialize them with other animals. We don't usually recommend actually taking them to a lot of um, uh, dog parks unless you know the dogs that are there because not everybody handles their dogs in the same way. Choosing a pet, this is really important. Um, choosing the right pet for the, the person's behavior and lifestyle can stop a lot of um, uh, relinquishment uh, of animals. Many behavior uh, problems occur as a result of the client just having chosen a pet that was not appropriate for his or her lifestyle. A lot of people like to choose working dogs. They're really active dogs. They seem like a lot of fun, but they need to work. And if they're not working, they often choose to spend their energy in different ways uh, that are not compatible with living in a home. We can use medications and, and uh, treat behavior problems if we have the client's compliance. Um, but the problem is that the owner really needs to understand that in order to treat the pets appropriately, they need to start with behavior modification and they need to be committed to it. Otherwise, the medication won't be able to be helpful with the behavior problems. There's There are three different uh, medications that we use um, very frequently or, or that are actually labeled for use for behavior problems with animals. The first is Clomacom, 
which is clomipramine hydrochloride. It's a um, antidepressant, uh, anti-anxiety medication uh, for dogs, especially with fears or separation anxiety. Reconcile is the other one. It, you may know it as Prozac. It's flu, uh, fluoxetine. Reconcile is also used for antidepress, antidepressant anti-anxiety medication. Um, so both Clomacom and Reconcile are labeled for use in dogs for those things. Anapril is something is a medication that we use for a couple of different things with animals. Um, but in behavior, we use it for dogs that are suffering from dementia, so cognitive um, dysfunction uh, syndrome. Uh, so dogs, older dogs that aren't thinking queer, uh, quite clearly, we will use Anapril for. So those are the three medications we will use. Getting a behavior history. Um, so uh, one thing that I'm going to have you do uh, is to talk about an issue that you have or you know that someone has with their pet. Give us the history on that. Um, you're going to do this in a discussion. Explain this behavior scientifically. Don't anthropomorphize. Anthropomorphize is associating um, human feelings and emotions with the pet's behaviors. Remember, put it into action words. Uh, you're going to use your five-step plan and then talk about whether we're going to need medication or not. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about development and behavior so you can have an understanding of why we, we try to get that behavior under control early on and how we can do that. We're also going to talk about um, equine cattle and small ruminant behavior so you can have an understanding of that as well. There are four stages of canine development. There's neonatal, newborn, transitional, socialization, and then juvenile. Um, I have a chart here that uh, this says German Shepherd development, but honestly, it's any puppy development. Um, so first, first of all, neonatal help, helpless baby. Um, there's they have very they have no sight, minimal hearing and smell. They're just seeking warmth and nutrition. That's all they do. It's their mother um, in order to to get really good uh, behavior growth. Um, that, along with the transitional, where they're in weeks two to three, they're starting to discover the world beyond mom's body. Um, you have to understand that puppies, when they grow up as litter in, in a litter, they are already developing their personality at this time. It's important for them to have that litter um, mentality where they have to fight for a nipple and they have to work with each other to determine when they can eat and where they can eat. Um, that's all a really important part of their behavior development. Um, weeks three to seven to eight, also extremely important for them to be, to they're with mom until week eight. They are much better at uh, un using and understanding body language, bite inhibition with siblings, accepting a reprimand from mom, um, eliminating away from their sleeping area, and making sure they're not taking food from another dog's mouth. All of those things are really important to them. So if you're getting a puppy at four to five weeks old because they're just weaned from mom, they're missing a huge portion of their, uh, of their dog understanding. They're, they do go through a fear period at weeks 8 to 11. Um, they're more susceptible to scary situations, so you don't want to force them into anything scary. You want to be real gentle with them at this point. Human socialization starts at about this time, 7 to 8, seven to eight weeks to 12 weeks. We really want to get them really used to starting formal obedience training, house training, bite inhibition, um, making sure they have positive interactions with everything. Um, so, and then in their juvenile period, when they're weeks set 12 to 16, up to four months, they're starting to be independent, a little bit more independent, self-reliant. They're finding their place in your pack. Uh, you want to really avoid dominance-based training techniques. Try to be more confident with them, with a the gentle leader, um, and just uh, really working on training. This is the best time. They are there at their best during this time uh, in really getting it. I will warn you that right after this period they go into their teenage phase and they start pushing boundaries. And so you have to really, once you get that them really good in this juvenile period, it's really important to start to, to keep 
doing this during their teenage phase, which can last till they're about a year and a half to two years of age. Dogs are not like wolves, even though they originally domesticated from them. It's been thousands of years since they've been wolves. Um, so their dominant role versus uh, subordinate role is a little less um, uh, in a part of their personality trait. So it's not really a personality trait. We can, we can mold that a little bit. Dogs use visual and olfactory cues when meeting, forming, and maintaining social relationships. So it's important to look at these when they're working with each other. So looking for that T position and that play bow, um, those are really important things. Here's some pictures. This is a double T position. We have a nose to nose um, with a uh, dominant dog. Uh, we have um, somebody greeting appropriately, uh, greeting the um, rear end of a dog. Uh, that's absolutely appropriate, should be done. Um, and this dog should allow this to happen. If this is not being allowed to happen, they're not doing a, a proper greeting. After this particular thing, somebody's going to go into a play bow and initiate play. And this is normal behavior. This dog is showing some aggression leaning over top of this other dog. And uh, this dog is raising its paw. When you do see a dog raise its paw, that indicates that they're asking a question. What do you need me to do next in order to tell you that I am not a threat to you? Probably this dog at, at the, the next point will show its belly to show that it is not aggressive in any way. This dog will probably sniff at its belly, do a play bow, and run away. This dog is doing a play bow. This is really normal behavior. This tells you that um, a dog is ready to play. You can do a play bow to a dog uh, and they will likely respond in a very similar manner. It's really important that you understand or read canine body language. Um, most human directed aggression in dogs is fear related and it's not due to the dog trying to be dominant. It means that they're fearful and they've shown you ahead of time. It, people will often say it came out of nowhere. It didn't. You just missed the clues. And the problem is we can, we can really diminish our dog's clues that they're going to bite by yelling at them for doing all of these behaviors growling, um, showing their teeth, etc. Allow them those behaviors because they're telling you they're going to bite. If they've told you they're going to bite and then they bite, um, but you've yelled at them for telling you that they're going to bite and then they bite, that's, that's not their fault. It doesn't come out of nowhere. They are telling you. Fearful dogs show this in several visual cues that a lot of people miss. And the problem is that sometimes they can do these uh, behaviors and not be fearful. You have to look at their eyes. You have to look at their ears. You have to look at what they're doing next in order to, to um, see what's going to happen. So yawning, lip licking, shaking, panting, salivating, those are all signs that they're, they're stressed. This is a really good example of a dog that's showing you that they're stressed. They're not appreciating this hug. And in an interesting study of thousands of pictures of people holding dogs, hugging dogs, most of those dogs showed in some way that they were stressed during that encounter. So people holding dogs, hugging dogs, they are giving that stress uh, to that pet and we're not recognizing it. So that is a problem uh, within our society. You can see these ears are down and back. We have these half moon eyes. They're kind of bigger than they should be. Um, the head is a, a turn to avoid eye contact. Um, this animal is leaning away from this child. There, this, this dog has probably been trained not to bite this child, or that hopefully this child has been trained to just a short hug and move on. Um, so this dog won't have to bite this child, but you have to look for these things. So here's a, a chart of reading uh, canine body language, and it, is, um, it should be uh, in your book. Um, this is uh, calm and attentive um, arousal, so lifting the, the leg. Anytime they lift a leg, they're uncertain. They want to know what they're going to do, what they need to do next. Um, so uh, soliciting social interaction, hey, you want to play with me, um, uncertainty, Again, they're down. They're not really in a play bow. Um, they're lifting their leg. Um, this is withdrawing. They're backwards. They're they're moving backwards. Okay, so this is a defensive threat. They are moving forward. This is fear and anxiety. They're actually moving backward. 
This is complete withdrawal interaction and a protective posture. It's an example of a fearfully aggressive dog. Yes, their teeth are bared. Yes, they kind of look like they're moving forward. You can't see the rest of their body. Their tail is probably tucked. Their ears are back. Their ears are back. When their ears are back, that's a fear aggression. When we're dealing with, uh, we have to realize that most of the behaviors in the clinic that we see um, that are problems are fear-based. You can help to decrease this fear, and there's a huge movement to fear-free uh, uh, treatment in the in the um, in the clinic. We want to avoid staring, reaching over, bending over toward a fearful dog. Exactly everything that this person is doing. They're pulling on the leash. That tension creates tension. They've got their hand over top of this dog. The dog is trying to move away. Has its tail tucked, ears back, lipping. You want to turn, at least this person has turned sideways, but kneel down, um, bend down. Let the dog make that first approach. Use as the least restraint possible like these people are doing. Um, trying to give treats to this puppy while they're doing something they may not want to do. do. Um, as a student, you are um, permitted to do fear-free certification level one for free. Um, and I do have... Uh, can ask about that we'll we'll have uh, links available to you to try to get that uh, certification when we introduce a new dog to home we should always want to do that in neutral uh, area so ideally want leash allow plenty of space allow them to do dog behaviors there may be growls there may be snaps that's okay drawing blood is not okay um, there should they should be allowed to sniff at each other. Um, if you think there might be a problem, one of the best way to get dogs to interact as a pack is to take them for a walk together. So having a nose to nose greeting on a tense leash is the worst way to introduce a dog, especially if you're doing it in one dog's uh, normal space. Um, Unruliness, some common uh, behavior problems of dogs, unruliness or a play-related aggression. Um, they're being too exuberant uh, with their play. Um, that's because we haven't taught them how to play appropriately. Fear, phobias, anxiety, destructive behavior, uh, those are pretty common. So this dog is uh, acting in a fearful way. Um, this dog, uh, German Shepherds are often extremely fearful. It, it seems to have been bred in, into them, unfortunately. Um, and uh, so often we have to use like a soft muzzle in order to make sure that they're safe and can interact in a safe way. This is a um, destructive behavior. Obviously, this dog has taken, has a lot of energy and so has taken it out on this chair. Canine aggression, um, offensive or offensive versus defensive. Most aggression is defensive. They're defending their territory or uh, defending their resources in some way, their food, their water, their territory. Um, very, very infrequently do we see a, 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 an offensive um, a posture where they're being aggressive in a dominant way. That's really not very common. Um, house soiling is common. Um, and that typically has to do with a medical uh, issue or we have a, uh, a dog that doesn't understand that they're supposed to go outside um, or there's, it's a fear or um, anxiety uh, related issue. I will tell you that this dog does not associate this puddle of yellow material that smells like pee. Uh, they may know it's their pee, but they don't associate this with being bad. What they do associate is this person leaning over them with a finger pointing, yelling at them. That's bad. So they start to associate the smell of pee with the owner as being a bad thing, but not necessarily the act of peeing in the house. So we've got to separate those actions. Cognitive dysfunction is that last one. It's the, the older dog, the senior dog that doesn't, isn't really aware of what it's doing. Okay, signs of cognitive, canine cognitive disorder is that the dog doesn't recognize you 
barks at night for no reason, gets confused, turns away from petting, no longer greets your arrival. They don't wag their tail like they used to. They leave messes in the home. And Anapril, that, that medication, Anapril, that's the medication we'll use for that. Cats, um, they're slightly different from dogs. Uh, they do have similar developmental periods, but they're a little bit shorter. Handling kittens 15 minutes a day from two to six weeks of age will result in kittens that are much friendlier. Cats that are bottle fed as single babies tend to be a little bit too friendly and tend to be a little bit more aggressive towards people uh, because they see themselves as fitting within the uh, person hierarchy. Friendliness in cats also has a heritable component. So if you have a cat, a mama cat, um, or even a, a papa cat who is not friendly, that actually can translate, uh, translate into the uh, kitten behavior. Tolerance of other cats can be limited for some cats, but they are highly adaptable. So cats are typically uh, single and solitary creatures. Um, they can bond to one or two other cats, but it's, it's unlikely that they will bond uh, to three or more other cats. Usually you will have a hierarchy and some issues within the household when you have additional cats. So a, a feline body language is important to understand, and it really associates their eyes, their ears, and their um, tail, mostly. A high tail is a greeting, investigation, or frustration. It depends on how they're holding it and how they're um, um, moving it. Aggression, they may be in their tiptoes, head down, rear uh, is higher than their fore, uh, they're ready to pounce, um, pilo erection in the tail, swiveled ears. Fear is when they're crouched with flat ears and a tucked tail, their eyes are dilated and they're spitting or hissing, um, and you'll see that often in the cage. Predatory aggression, their body is carried low to the ground, it's like this cat here in the picture. Um, they're slow, silent move forward, and they're, uh, they'll pause, they'll tail twitch, and then they'll pounce. Um, so it's really important to, to see and look at a, a cat in a, a way that their, their actions that they're doing to see what's going on with them. With uh, pets in the cats in the clinic, most domesticated cats don't like major changes in their environment, so coming to the clinic is not fun for them. Um, they're less likely to enjoy going places than dogs. Um, you can train your cat to like going places. Um, I have done that with a cat before where he would jump, eagerly jump into the car and go places with the dog, uh, but it did, did take more time than teaching a dog uh, that it was okay to go places. Fearful cats um, aren't often interested in food uh, while in the clinic, so giving them a food treat isn't always um, fun to do. But if you start with a kitten, um, often they don't associate uh, the clinic with shots, they associate it with food. This is a pheromone. Feel Away is a pheromone that we use with cats. It helps to, it's, it, it mimics cats' um, calm behavior. The pheromone they put out when they're calm, relaxed, so we can spray this on towels, on our hands, when handling cats, and it actually can have some effect on keeping them calm. When you introduce a new cat to an environment, you want to prepare the home first for the new cat by having a separate room so they can spend the first few days for even three weeks in that home. So you want to have a solid door between the cats, a litter box, food and water, and several vertical resting spaces. Cats determine uh, vertical spaces. So if you have a single family home or single uh, floor home, it's important to have shelves or places where the cats can go jump onto. After a new cat settles in, uh, the cat's places can be exchanged and exploring can occur. Common behavior uh, problems with cats, unruly behaviors, destructive behavior, inner cat aggression, and then aggression towards people. And inner cat aggression can turn into aggression towards people. They can change their, uh, uh, they can uh, do a uh, substitute aggression. Uh, once they're, once cats are aggressive or fearful, they tend to stay in that state for a long period of time, hours. Uh, this is an example of inner cat aggression. Um, I don't know if you can see which cat is being aggressive, um, but it's actually this black cat. They use their eyes and their um, eye contact to uh, initiate aggression. So this cat watching the other one try to sneak by the, the door is, um, is preparing to be aggressive. 
Irritable aggression, uh, we see this with cats. If you have a cat that you can pet exactly three times and then it bites you, um, they, they're just telling play with their kittens um, with their hands can can cause them to go into this irritable aggression or even predatory aggression very easily so we really caution people not to use their hands when they're playing with their kittens or their cats you want to use toys that get them away from your body we don't want to associate hands or feet with predatory items Redirected aggression is when the animal is already hyped up, anxious, uh, fearful, aggressive, and they turn their aggression to you. House soiling, it's really important that we differentiate urine marking from elimination because it could be a medical condition versus a behavioral condition. If a cat is uh, eliminating on a vertical surface, that's spraying, and that's usually a behavioral condition. If they are eliminating on a flat surface, uh, that is inappropriate urination. That usually has to do with a medical condition. So it's important that you determine which, what is going on. Um, and one really common place for this to occur is if you have a cat that's outside and a cat that's inside. Th these two cats can see each other in, and they're eating near each other, which that's good. Sometimes they can associate food with being calm around other cats. But very often what you'll see is eliminating around this door um, to establish territory. Cats can also get cognitive dysfunction. Um, so again, this comes back to the behavioral discussion you'll have in your class. If you have a cat that's urinating in the house, you want to make sure that you are determining is it marking or eliminating? Is it medical or behavioral? What is going on with that cat? Describe the actions. Horses. Horses rely on herd behavior for safety. These are prey animals, not predatory animals. Um, they communicate through ear positions, foot stomping, pawing, vocalizations, olfaction, uh, that's smelling, uh, aloe grooming, which is grooming each other, and snapping, especially foals. Foals snap a lot. Um, they do have a blind spot directly behind them and directly below the nose, so if you come out of that blind spot um, uh, quickly, it can um, disturb them, uh, cause them to strike out fearfully. Uh, they whinny or neigh in a greeting or as a separation call. And they will nicker when uh, they see someone they love. Um, they s will squeal uh, when they're in defensive mode or be being aggressive. Looking at their tail posture and ears and the shape of the muscles on their face is what you look for when you're um, trying to read a horse. So tail posture, I have a chart here that I want you to go over. You know, are, is it up? Is it flowing back? Is it um, really up? Is it tucked um, down? Uh, and these are um, uh, the, the different, the colors are associated. You can see that there's not a huge amount of um, uh, variability in some of these, um, the way they have the, the tail position. So you have to learn to look for those subtleties. The ears are subtle as well. Um, so you really want to see these ears forward and relax. They could be turned back and relaxed as well. Um, if they're pointed stiffly forward, that's a problem. If they're pointed stiffly back, huge problem. So if if they're uh, um, either really forward or really back, that's when we have to be really cautious. This is an example of um, aloe grooming. Uh, these two are uh, using their teeth to scrape each other's back, scratch each other's backs. So socially, um, they exist in free-range bands consisting of several mares and offspring younger than three years and a single stallion. Uh, mares form relatively stable dominance hierarchy with the oldest usually um, the highest ranking. Um, in domestic horses, um, they form similar hierarchies, but most of the domestic horses form hierarchies in terms of geldings with one mare and then um, possibly a, a number of mares with one gelding. Depends on your social structure and your own in the barn. Um, hierarchies are not formed if the animal is stabled most of the time. So it's usually formed within the, within the uh, pasture. Um, it's really important that they, they form this hierarchy to decrease aggression because when horses are aggressive with each other, they're really aggressive. 
um, if we don't have stable social relationships, that serves as a predisposing factor to behavior problems. So if you have a horse that stays within its stall um, 24 hours a day or 23 hours a day or 20, even 20 hours a day um, uh, and doesn't, isn't able to develop these social relationships or you have an animal that is moved from stable to stable to stable and doesn't develop those social relationships that can um, cause a lot of behavior problems. So being in a band um, really and allowing them to, to be out to pasture or at least together in a dry lot can be helpful in um, uh, re reducing behavior issues. Um, so and because it helps, it gives them a sense of safety. Um, when a group of horses is alarmed, the first seeing the alarm stimulus will um, respond by raising the, the head and neck and focus attention on the threat. A solitary horse is going to be a lot more cautious and maybe a little bit more um, fearful or aggressive. Um, if you're wanting to work around horses, you need to stay calm and confident. You become that um, dominant uh, mare or the dominant um, uh, leader in the pack, in the herd. Sexual behavior is important to uh, understand too. Most mares are not uh, altered in any way. Um, when you're dealing with stallions, they can be extremely dangerous to deal with. So it's important to understand this. Um, winking is a term that we use when we're talking about a receptive mare in estrus. When she's going through a heat cycle, her vulva will wink, her tail will be will flag off to the side, um, and she may be a little bit more touchy or aggressive to watch that. They can have some silent heat or an abnormal estrus if we are cycle. Um, but typically, um, we'll talk about this later, but typically uh, active. So during long uh, days, during the spring and summer, they tend to be in heat and that's going to affect the stallion's reproductive um, behavior uh, as well. Um, we have to be very careful if you are working with stallions, never punishment punish them for normal sexual behaviors because their job is to impregnate um, mares and if you are punishing them for um, for being normal se normally sexual then you are not allowing them to do their job properly uh, masturbation is one of the normal behaviors of stallions uh, we have to be very careful um, to allow them if it, if they are a stallion to allow them to um, be um, sexually active because otherwise you'll see a lot of self mutilation a mare uh, and a foal uh, need to uh, bond. Um, this is really important for the maternal behavior. If you interrupt that bonding uh, right after the foal is born, you can interrupt them for about 15 minutes and then you have to just let them be together. Uh, that can It can really damage the relationship um, and we need them to have a good relationship in order for the foal to grow up normally um, behaviorally. Olfaction is the primary recognition signal, so they use their noses. Uh, Free-ranging mares do not wean their phone <clears throat> foals until they're 5 to 15 weeks before the birth of their next foal, which will be a year or two late two after their first foal. So we usually wean foals in, in this in um, captivity at about six months of age, which you know in some ways can be very detrimental to the behavior of these horses. Imprint training is, is controversial, but it can be really helpful in socializing the foal to people. If we can do a fair, uh, fair, uh, mares and foals imprint on each other right after birth, if we can take 15 to 20 minutes right after birth and put a halter on the, on the foal really quickly uh, for a few minutes and take it off and rub them down with straw, uh, pick, uh, handle their feet, um, put a rope on them, put a, put a, a sack on them, kind of get them used to a lot of different handling techniques, just real briefly, they will remember that. It will be something in their memory for their lifetime, and it can be really helpful in training them later on. Um, if a mare rejects a foal, that's an emergency. We have to address this right away because we need to get colostrum and uh, mare's milk into the foal right away within 24 hours, really within an hour or so, we really want to get that colostrum uh, into the foal. If we don't get it into it, it can actually um, lead to death of the foal.
Some common behavior problems with, we see with um, uh, horses, and I've got videos of these uh, in your eLearn and also uh, links to these videos uh, on this um, lecture. Uh, most of these are repetitive behaviors. We call these stereotypical behavior. Uh, one example of a stereotypical behavior that you might um, uh, kind of be able to see in your head is uh, an, a lion uh, pacing in a cage. That's a stereotypical behavior. Um, we call these in horses, we call them stable vices because they occur because we have inappropriate management. Uh, we have an animal that's high energy animal kept in a stall 20 hours a day. That's going to create some problems. So um, cribbing is a, a common and wind sucking. There's cribbing and wind sucking is uh, common. Uh, weaving, uh, teeth grinding, uh, lip smacking, uh, head bobbing. These are all pretty common um, stall behaviors that we see. Um, I have two horses on my property that are um, that were kept in a stall for a period of time and both of these have a head bobbing weaving um, uh, issue when they're in a, when they're stressed the horses that i have that have been kept on pasture for most of their lives don't have any of these behaviors um, inner horse aggression is most likely to occur when you have different established groups that are mixed i have one horse that i added to my uh, herd uh, about a year and a half ago and the first six months were horrible i had to separate the horses because uh, there was a lot of chasing biting kicking uh, occurring when i added this gelding to the to the herd um, aggression towards humans is often seen in the stalled horse, and this is a learned response. This means that at some point uh, they learn to be fearful of a human. We can use behavior modification in order to be successful in curbing this behavior. Cattle and small ruminants. Hoofed ruminants are commonly kept um, livestock, so cattle, goats, and sheep. Um, they are highly social. They're herd dwelling and they're grazing prey animals. Um, smell is the most important um, tool they have in recognizing conspecifics. Those are people within their own, their, their own species, determining estrus and mutual recognition. So it's important for them to have that. Um, vocalization, visual cues, and social facilitation is very helpful. Um, Allo grooming happens in cattle as well. They're, they have muzzle to muzzle affection in sheep and goats, and goats butt heads a lot. That's how they establish hierarchy. Sheep will do that as well. Um, so it's important to know that because they'll do that with you too. Dominant and aggressive behaviors. Um, cattle, when they put their broad side to you, when they turn their uh, body to you, um, and they have their head low and perpendicular to the ground, that is a threat. You need to be aware of that. Rearing and budding um, happens with goats, and that it generally happens when goats first meet you. Um, uh, they will rush at you, and sometimes they'll do it from behind and get you from behind, so you do have to be aware of that. Um, submissive behaviors, their head will be low, but it's parallel to the ground and their ears are out. They may do a head shake, they may look away, um, that's sheep and goats. Sick or pregnant cows will withdraw and lose status within their herd temporarily, but when they come back uh, stronger, um, they will gain their uh, status back. With maternity, um, primiparous females are more likely to reject a neonate than multiparous females. That means, primiparous means it's their first uh, birth. They just don't understand what's happening, so they'll reject the neonate. Common behavior problems within the herd. One thing is a buller steer syndrome. A buller steer is a, a steer that is bullied. So it's the lowest hierarchy, and um, other steers uh, will mount the steer repeatedly and cause damage to their um, first um, damage to their coat to their um, hair. Uh, you'll see wearing down of the hair and then it will cause damage to their skin, which is damage to the leather. Um, it's, uh, it's stressful for that animal that's, um, that's being bullied. Uh, they do need to be removed. Aggression to humans, hand-raised individuals, whether it's really any animal that's hand-raised, if we're not raising them as their mother would raise them, um, can cause uh, aggression in that animal. 
Um, open range animals habituate, we want to habituate them to using a chute several times without performing any procedures so that they just get used to that. Um, otherwise, they're pretty wild animals uh, and uh, they will just associate that chute with um, harmful uh, things. Um, treatment uh, so we want to be very very careful with them avoid raising your voice and hitting them they can be extremely extremely aggressive that's what we have for behavior I know it's a lot of information I find it really interesting if you stay curious about um, the behavior all of this stuff will settle in um, and you'll it'll start becoming part of your your normal routine to look at animal behavior um, and assess it really quick